All right, are there any questions? Right. So, towards the end of the last lecture, right, I was, going to, I was trying to show you how you can alter those Boolean functions, right, in the probabilistic Boolean network definition, how you can alter the truth table, right, in order to alter the steady state distribution, right, or the steady state probability of, of being in those different states, right. So I'm going to go over that again because it was done hurriedly towards the end of the lecture, right, before moving on to the next topic. And today I'm quite confident that I will finish, you know, the genomic signal processing part of this course, right. And I think you will see the big picture, everything fitting in together, right. And of course there are a lot of you know, unanswered questions, right, but I know there are several of you in this class that are now looking for research topics, right, and I will tell you what kind of problems the master's students can work on versus what kind of problems the PhD students can work on. Of course, you have to do a lot of study after what I'm teaching in this class, you know, but at least you will see how, you know, your research problem will fit within the bigger picture. Right. So, we were actually looking at this particular example, right, where we had three different genes, right, and this is a, a, a Boolean network or, a, or a probabilistic Boolean network. So each gene can is, is gene expression is quantized to two levels, all right? Zero and one, all right? Because of that, if you have three genes, you have a total of eight possible states: zero, 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 all the way up to one, one, one. Okay. Now, for each of these genes, all right, you have some predictors that are given by this truth table, right? So for gene number one, all right, you have two predictors: F, this F11. All right, is the, is the first predictor set. F12 uh, is the second predictor set, right? And these are chosen according to different probabilities. With the probability of 0.6, you will choose this first predictor set. With the probability of 0.4, you'll choose the second predictor set, right? Now, this is a toy example, but it'll at least illustrate the main concepts, right? So these were the predictor sets for the first gene. For the second gene, you have only one predictor set, so the probability is one, right? And then for the third gene, again, you have two predictor sets, and each of those predictor sets are equally probable. Right. So, given this information, right, you can get the state transition diagram because if you are in state 0, 0, 0, right, this tells you that you will go to 0, 0, 0. Regardless of which predictor you choose, all right, the first gene will go to 0. Second gene will stay at 0. Third gene will stay at 0, right. So, you can use these probabilities, right, to compute the probability of going from any state to any other state, all right. And the details about how to do that, all the math and all that, is given in those papers, right? So in, in this example, you actually come up with this uh, state transition diagram, right, which is showing the transition between the different states. And these numbers, C1, C2, C3, they are from the bottom of that table, okay? And we pointed out last time that, that uh, you know, if you, if you lo look at this region here, right, there is no way of getting out, right? There, there is no path that is leading out from from, the, from this set of states here, okay, I pointed that out. And let's say, hypothetically, right, let's say that this state 0, 0, 0 is a good absorbing state. Absorbing state means if you get in there, you stay there forever after, because with the probability of 1, you go back here, right, you don't get out. Same way, 1, 1, 1 also is an absorbing state for a Markov chain, right? This is actually the transition diagram for a Markov chain. So for those of you that are going to take Professor Kumar's course, Next semester, I'm recommending that highly. Some of you have already taken it, right? You, you will learn a lot more about, about, about this stuff, right, about, about Markov chains. He actually starts his course with the discussion of Markov chains, right, transition probabilities and all those things, state, state distribution and so on. Okay? So I would recommend that you take that class. But uh, for, for this lecture, you only need to know that 0, 0, 0 is an absorbing state. If you get in here, you stay there forever after. 1, 1, 1 is also an absorbing state. If you get in here, somehow you get in here, you're not going to get out. Okay, and let's assume, all right, for the sake of discussion, that this guy is a bad state. Right, one, one, one is a bad state. You just don't want to be there. Right, maybe th this leads to uncontrolled cell proliferation. Right, whereas this one is a good state. It's a quiescent state where you know it's, uh, the behavior is normal. Right, so if somehow you get in here, all right, you would like to get out and and hopefully get in over there. Okay, because it, that's the absorbing state. All right, that uh, is considered to be good. Right. Now, in this particular network, right, or in this transition diagram, you cannot go from any state to any other state, right? So how do you fix that problem, right? So you make the Markov chain ergodic, right? Ergodic means every state communicates with every other state, right? One state communicates with another. If you can go from state A to state B and vice versa, right? The transition has to be both ways. It might take you 10,000 steps to go, right? But you can... 
In theory, you can go from one state to the other. So here, this is, this is a, a Markov chain where all the states do not communicate, right? So you can s solve that problem, right, by saying that, okay, there is a small probability, right, that any gene can flip. Like you have 101, right? It's not a state transition, but let's say this one, the rightmost one suddenly flips to a zero, right? Then you would have gone to state 100, zero, 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 right? So if you introduce that small probability that any state can flip, right, this is a random perturbation, then uh, all states basically communicate, right? And you have what is called an ergodic Markov chain, right? And for such a chain, you can show that there is a steady state probability distribution. That means in the steady state, you can compute what is the probability, right, that in the long run, you will be in this state. In the long run, you'll be in this state and so on, right? And all these numbers together have to add up to one because you have to be somewhere in the steady state. Okay, it doesn't mean for sure you're going to be here, but there is a probability, the steady state probability of being in this state, right? So what I'm going to do here is, you know, starting from the original, uh, original uh, two table that I have, right? I'm going to go and introduce that perturbation, small perturbation, let's say probability of 0 0.01, right, of perturbing any gene, so that all states start communicating and then I can calculate the steady state distribution, right? So if you do the calculation, then again, I mean, it's a routine calculation, it's spelled out in that paper. If you, want, if you have the time, you can go and read that. But once you do the calculation, you find out, right? Yeah, all this stuff I already covered, now I'm looking at, at how to alter the steady state behavior. So if you do the calculation, again, I'll show you with an example. So for this PBN, right, the two table that I showed you, if you uh, go and uh, assume a small perturbation probability 0 0.01, you do the calculation and you calculate the stationary or steady state probabilities, you find that the probability corresponding to 0, 0, 0, which was a good state is only 0 0.0752. And for the bad state, it's 0 0.7310, right? So you would like to alter this scenario because the bad state has got a much higher probability mass in the steady state, right? So, how do you, so the question is, can you alter this scenario, right? Well, you go back to that truth table, right? You go back to that truth table, and, and this is a brute force procedure. It's not something neat. But if you go back to that earlier truth table, right, you can look at how many possibilities there are, uh, there, there are there, right? So here, this entry could have been 0 or 1, right? The next one also 0 or 1. So if you look at each column, right, there are 2 to the power of 8 possibilities, right, 256. And if you look at each row, there are five rows, right? So it's 256 times five, right? That is the total number of different truth tables that you can have, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and, you know, stick in, go through all those 1,280 possibilities. For each of them, I will compute the steady state distribution, right? The steady state probability mass corresponding to 0, 0, 0, steady state probability mass corresponding to 1, 1, 1. Right. I can do that. It's a, it's a brute force computation, but it can be done. Right. And then I can plot. Right. I can plot the steady state probability mass corresponding to 0, 0, 0 versus the steady state probability mass corresponding to 1, 1, 1. Right. And these things, or right, these circles, they are all those 1,280 possibilities. Right. And let's say I want that, you know, both these states have equal mass. Let, let's say 0.4 for each one of them. Right. Then 0.4, 0.4 for, for this one, steady state probability mass, for that one, 0.4, and then the rest of the states will have to share the remaining probability mass of 0.2, right? So then I pick up the optimal, uh, optimal predictor set, because, see, I would know which, which, which set of predictors right, produ produce this point here, right? So that is going to tell me, you know, how I need to change that rule base, right, in order to get the desired steady state distribution, right? So... So this, again, is another paper, and, and it's, it's actually referenced in the syllabus. I have referenced it, right? It's one of those papers that talks about altering the steady state distribution. And uh, uh, the only additional step that they have taken here is that, uh, in this paper, is that they use a method that is called genetic algorithms, right? To uh, try to compute this in, in a not so brute force way, okay? Because you're trying to see some patterns, and then, you know, instead of having to go exhaustively through those 1,280 cases, right? Can I do like a fewer number of cases, right, to get there? And again, this is not set in concrete. It's like more hand-waving, but that's what they did in that paper. Okay. So any questions on this? So we have looked at intervention by perturbing a single gene, right, flipping a gene, moving it from one state to another, and then hopefully 
you know, things are improved, or altering the steady state distribution by trying to forcibly change the truth table, right? And maybe you can use drugs to do that, right? In the presence of drugs, the interactions, the rules for interaction between the different genes might change. Okay. So before I proceed further, any questions? Dynamics, yeah. Yeah, but see, the the thing is that as long as that probability is small, that P is like 0 0.01, 0 0.001, I mean, it, it's going to make the math go through and allow you to calculate the steady state probabilities, okay? But, you know, you expect that the pro probability mass, okay, will still be small. Like, for example, in that state, 0, 0, 0, we saw that it was small, right? I mean, but if you don't make that change, then all states don't communicate. Right, and again, I mean, making that change, this is making that assumption about all states communicating. Right, this is actually, uh, I would say, it's more of an academic assumption. Right, because see, if if the cell goes into apoptosis, right, or it differentiates, you're not going to have all states communicating. Right, so realistically, from a biological point of view, I don't think that assumption is correct. Right, I mean, it was introduced. The reason this was introduced was because some engineers developed it, right? So they want to use the theory of Markov chains, right? But if you talk to a biologist, like if you talk to Mike Bittner, he will say that that's not a reasonable assumption, right? And I believe, I believe, right? And no, actually, I know for sure. There is somebody uh, at, uh, I think it's the University of Chicago or something, that actually got an NIH R01 grant, okay? Trying to relax that assumption. I, I don't know how good the quality of the work is, what the follow-up work was, okay? But exactly the po problem that you pointed out, because biologically, this does not make sense. You know, if all the states communicate, right? There's really no way, once the cell has differentiated, you're not going to be able to get it uh, back to becoming a stem cell, okay? Or if there's apoptosis, the cell is going to die, right? You can, if it's cell cycling, it's okay, right? If you're looking at the different stages of the cell cycle, yeah. So these are some limit, limitations. You know, th this is not like a saturated field that everybody has solved all the problems. It's not like, you know, uh, let's say like controls or something where, you know, people have been working for 50 years, you know. So there are a lot of, lot of open holes and you, you pointed one of those out. Yeah. Okay, any questions? All right, so that was the discussion of this example from last time. So now I'll move on to external intervention based on optimal control theory, right? And this is stuff that I was involved with like about 13 years ago, right? So, so, and and again, the reason I'm confident that I'll be able to finish all of this stuff today is because this is basically two talks, okay? And a lot of the stuff is introductory material that I have already covered at great length in this course. You guys have taken exam, an exam on it. You're going to take another exam, so you know this stuff, so right? So I can go over it quite quickly, all right? And of course, the math part I will point out right, as we go along. And I'm happy to take any questions that you might have, right, as we go along. All right. So again. While giving this talk, I have to start with the review of Boolean networks and uh, probabilistic Boolean networks. So you have the deterministic Boolean networks. If you have n genes, all right, if xi is the expression status of the i gene, the expression, uh, the gene expression is taken to be binary. If it's zero, the i gene is not expressed. If it's one, the i gene is expressed, all right? And these Boolean networks were introduced by a guy by the name of Stuart Kaufman, right? And uh, I mean, I think he introduced it in the 1960s, but he wrote a book on, on, on what he calls the origins of order, self-organization, and selection in evolution. So if you're interested, you can take a look at that book. Too. So the key defining property of a Boolean network, all right, is that the evolution of each gene will proceed as a Boolean function, right, of the activity status of the other genes in the network at that time point. Usually it'll be a small number, right? So xi at time k plus one is some Boolean function of the current activity status of all the genes. And usually you don't need all of them. Usually it'll be just two or three, right? And as I said before, you know, only so, so many genes can affect another gene directly, right? Because the promoter region is kind of limited, right? And as you may have guessed, I have to give, sometimes give this talks, uh, talk to biologists and people who don't know Boolean logic. So this is just showing them, you know, and or gates and things like that, right? But for you guys, it's trivial, right? So then, you, uh, you define the state vector, right, or the gene activity profile, right, made up of the exp expression status of all these n genes, and so you have a nonlinear dynamical system, right. That at time k plus one, the state activity vac vector has these components, which are given by those n different Boolean functions, right. And equivalently, you can represent this using a state transition diagram, just like we did before, right, 
for a Boolean network with, let's say, with three genes, or as a truth table like this. All right, so if you're in state 0, 0, 0, you'll go to 1, 1, 1, all right? And that's what should happen here, yeah, 0, 0, 0, you're going to 1, 1, 1, all right? So the, all this information is equivalent. So now you can alternatively represent a, a Boolean network, all right, mathematically, all right? Although it's a nonlinear system, you can represent it as a linear system, right? How? By increasing the dimension of the state space, all right? So given a, a, a gene ac activity profile, right, that's just a binary string, you can write down its decimal equivalent, right? And uh, uh, decimal equivalent plus one, all right? And then you're going to consider two to the power of n dimensional basis vectors, all right? With each basis vector corresponding to one of those strings, right? That's what we have already done, right? I'm just repeating that here, right? So if you do that, then you're able to represent the behavior of this highly nonlinear system, all right? By this linear equation, W at k plus one is W k times a, where W is a row vector, right? which has one in one location, zeros everywhere else, right? And then matrix A is going to be a two to the power of n by two to the power of n matrix, which will have only one non-zero entry, right? Of one in each row and zeros everywhere else, right? Then you generalize this to probabilistic Boolean networks, right? So what is the generalization to PBNs? Basically, the transition is not given just by one Boolean function. It's given by the transition fun function for the i gene, right? Uh, is going to be this first function with a certain probability, second function with certain probability, and so on, and all these guys have to add up to one, right? And if you go and synthesize the network, the corresponding transition diagram, right? So this is what, what you're going to have, right? So there will be a number of Boolean networks, right? It's a combination of a number of Boolean networks, and at each time point, you're selecting between the Boolean networks according to those, those different probabilities, right? That can be shown. And so if you're in, let's say, in state zero, 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 right? And if you're in <clears throat> that first network, all right, then you will transition to 0, 0, 1. On the other hand, if you are in the same state 0, 0, 0, but you happen to be in the second network, you will transition to 1, 1, 1. Right? So you will see different transitions depending on which network you are in. Right? So here you will transition to 1, 1, 1. Right? And in this case, you can again do a mathematical representation of the probabilistic Boolean network. How? Do exactly the same thing as before. Right? But now, you, instead of that, you know, uh, unit basis vectors of dimension 2 to the power of n, you're going to have what is called the probability distribution vector, right? Or it is the vector of occupation probabilities, right? So wik is the probability that Z, zk equals i, and then you basically have a Markov chain, right? Where a is a stochastic matrix of transition probabilities, right? So it's a matrix where all the rows sum up to 1, right? They're, they are non-negative, and they all sum up to one. Right. And this becomes a standard homogeneous Markov chain. Right. And so, you know, Markov chains have been studied like since, I don't know, the 40s, 50s, and all that. You know, so lots of powerful results are available. Right. And, and this is the reference for the paper where probabilistic Boolean networks were first introduced. So if you want more details, just look this paper up and go and read it from, you know, A to Z. Right. Any questions? Now, if you look at these Boolean networks, this is not a, uh, not a control mark of change. There is no control here, OK? So when I first uh, was introduced to this problem, right, uh, what I thought was that you know, if you're trying to treat cancer, right, if you're trying to give the person radiation, chemotherapy, and so on, right, that is going to alter the transition probabilities of the network. Right? And so the key question is, you know, knowing that my control action is going to alter the transition probabilities, can I uh, choose that control action in an optimal way? Let's say if you're treating a cancer patient, you'll give them radiation for some time. Then, you know, see where the state ends up. Is it going to end up in a good state, all right? That's the idea. And again, I mean, the control part and all that, that was worked out in the literature a long time back, okay? So it's, my contribution is just making the connection here, right? It is not, the, like the control of Markov chains is a well-studied area, all right? Uh, in uh, operations research and, and, and in, in many other areas, right? A lot of things, you know, you can model them stochastically, right? So for external optimal control in PBNs, we know that the transition probabilities will depend on external control inputs, example, chemotherapy, radiation, et cetera, all right? So let's suppose we have M control inputs. There are M different controls that you can use. And again, I mean, to keep things simple, suppose the controls are also binary, right? So if you're using a drug, you'll say either it's applied or not applied. You can make it more complicated. You can put in different dosing and things like that, okay? 
different levels of the drug and all that stuff, you know. But that, but that's like putting icing on the on the cake, you know. So this is just the basic, basic stuff, all right. So let's assume that the values of the control inputs can be changed with time. Again, this is a problem, all right. This is not like a regular engineering system where you can alter the control at every time point, all right. My biologist collaborator told me that you can either flip a gene, right, from high to low, or vice versa, vice versa, once or at most twice, all right. You cannot keep on changing the control. So this is not the standard control problem that we are all exposed to in the controls engineering classes. Right? So there are constraints on the control. So anyway, I mean, like, assuming that the value of the control input can be changed and you have M inputs, so, and you're saying each input can either be applied or not applied, so you're going to have a vector of size M, right? That is going to describe the activity status of the different controls, right? And as before, you could, I mean, this is also going to be a binary string you could replace it by a decimal equivalent, right? Just to make things compact, right? And in this case, this uh, string nu k, it can take on the two to the power of m values corresponding to the two to the power of m different possibilities for control, all right? Because those are the combinations. And so now, if you do that, you have a control Markov chain, right? Where this A, this transition probability matrix A now depends on your control, right? It's, it's called a control Markov change or, or what is called a Markov decision process, right? And, and these things, in Professor Kumar's class, he covers them in great detail, right? So you don't have to feel scared or worried or whatever. You know, anyway, you're not taking a test on this, right? So, so here the transition probability matrix depends on the control input, right? It becomes a controlled homogeneous Markov chain, or what is, so if you look at the control literature, it's called a control Markov chain. If you look at the operations research literature, it's called a Markov decision process, right? So it is extensively studied in many areas like queuing theory and so on. Right. So now the problem will become a problem of optimal control of Markov chains, right? Because the biological problem we have now reduced to the problem of controlling a Markov chain, right? So the control problem here is to choose a sequence of control inputs, nu zero, nu one, and so on, to minimize a particular cost function, right? And the question is, how do you choose the cost function, right? So, and again, you can look at two sets of problems. One of them is you can look at a finite horizon problem where you'll control it over a finite number of steps, right? And then try to get somewhere. Hopefully, you got to a good position, right, in this finite number of steps, and then let it evolve from there. So that's the problem that we will look at first. The ideas can be extended to the infinite horizon case, right? And for those of you that took the stochastic systems class, you know that, okay, in the infinite horizon case, you're going to come up with what kind of policy? See, there are a lot of people that took that class, right? In the, so in the infinite horizon case, what kind of policy do you come up with? See, it's not like just Professor Kumar asking questions at the beginning of the class. You know, even I can do that, right? <laughs> and many of you probably got A's, so <laughs> what happened? Anyway, I'm just kidding, you know. It's a stationary policy, right? Doesn't change with time. But anyway, we'll talk about them in a few minutes. All right, so suppose the treatment horizon is finite. So you're looking at the finite horizon problem and say there are capital M steps, right? So K goes from zero up to M minus one. So, so you're going to do two things, okay? At every step, if you apply a control, there's a cost associated with that because the drugs would cost money and so on, okay? Or if you apply a drug, you might also mess up the patient, right? So you have to capture those in, in, in some mathematical entity. So let's see uh, sub K, all right, which is a function of the state, zk, and the control, denote the cost of applying control nu k at state zk, right? Now, again, I mean, you're going to transform this biological problem into a mathematical problem, right? So that your final answer makes, makes sense, biological sense, you have to get input from biologists about, you know, what, what kind of uh, penalty you should put, put, put on, on this control, right? And I'll, I'll show you one example that we worked out like about, uh, 13 years ago, you know, so how you can put in these penalties. So if, if, if the one, st one step cost is this, okay, and you're doing the control over M steps, all right, then the total control, the cost of control over those M minus one periods, right, or, or M steps, actually it should be M periods, as you go from zero to M minus one, will be the summation of all these costs, right, you add them together. But remember, this cost is not a, uh, it's not a deterministic quantity. Because even if you start out from some initial state, right, the transition to the next state is stochastic, right? So you are going to have to take the expectation, right? So you're conditioning the expectation on the initial starting point, 
and then you have to take this expectation, you get a number. So that is the total cost of applying the control, right, over these m time steps. So, but after the m time steps, all right, you, you stop applying any more control, but you, you've gotten to a particular state, right? Now you have to penalize that state because you don't want to end up in a bad state, right? So you, so the net result of the control action will be that the state will end up somewhere, let's say in Z, after capital M time steps, all right? Again, this is also random, right? So you must penalize this state in the cost to reduce chances of ending up in undesirable states, right? So define this cost associated with the terminal state to be the terminal cost of ending up in state ZM, right? So now you add the two costs together, right? So, uh, yeah, let me just, so, before, so the total cost will be the sum of the cost of control, right? Plus the terminal penalty, and then you take the expectation of that condition on your starting point. And you want to now choose your control input that is going to minimize this cost. Right? So this is the optimization problem that you want to solve. So how do you choose these terminal penalties, CM, ZM, right? That is, uh, which is a function of the terminal state. Well, one way to do that is maybe in, in that uh, PBN that you have, set all controls to zero. So the PBN is evolving by itself. Then all the states might not communicate, right? So partition the states into different equivalence classes, then higher, assign higher penalties to the states that are associated with rapid cell proliferation. You don't want that. That's going to lead to cancer or reduced apoptosis and lower penalties for states that are associated with normal cell cycle. Like, for example, if you were looking at that uh, toy example, that 111 would be a bad state. So I would assign a high penalty to 111, lower penalty to 000, right? Because that's where I want to go, okay? And again, even for this also, you would need input from biologists, right? Because you can solve a math problem and get the solution and run it on your computer. But later on, you want to interpret whether that makes biological sense or not, right? So the total cost will be the sum of these two costs, all right? And now you assume that, this, that, the, uh, that the control input, right, is a function of the state, right? So nu k is some function mu k of the state at time k, right? And so, so mu k is basically a mapping from the state space, because your state space is 2 to the power of n dimensional, right? Remember you had zero strings of zeros and ones, of, of, and there were 2 to the power of n possibilities, of length n, so there were 2 to the power of n possibilities. So mu k is a function that maps the state space to the control space. There are 2 to the power of m possibilities for the controls, right? So your problem now will become, the optimal control problem will become minimize over the choice of all those mu0, mu1 up to mu m minus 1, all right, this expectation, right? And subject to the control state transition equation, right? Probability that at time zk plus 1 equals j, conditioned on zk equal to i, and the control input is given by the ijth entry of the control probability transition matrix, right? This problem can be solved using dynamic programming, right? And again, I don't have time to cover dynamic programming here. If you take stochastic systems next semester, he's going to spend a lot of time, you know, covering dynamic programming and, you know, motivating it with, you know, that example of people, uh, you know, uh, going from, uh, from point A to point V and then you have different options, which option you choose and all that stuff. I don't have time to cover that here. But again, if you read my paper, right, uh, that is listed as one of the references in your syllabus, right? If you read the paper, I explain the basics of dynamic programming over there. So the point is that this problem can be solved right, using dynamic programming. So you will get the, the optimal control. All right, so I want to just illustrate that using an example that is called the Winty 5 a example. Uh, so, so we are going to apply this procedure, or at least in that initial 2003 paper, we applied this procedure to a, uh, to a network which is called a Winty 5 a network. Now, Winty 5 a is a gene that has been implicated in metastatic melanoma, right? Melanoma is a type of skin cancer, right? And you know metastasis is basically the spreading of cancer, right? So, so biologists have shown, and in fact, one of the biologists is right here, Mike Bittner, he was actually involved in this stuff, all right? So they, they have shown that if, uh, if that uh, winty 5 a gene expression is high, right? Then the melanoma has a very high chance of metastasizing, right? Conversely, if the expression of winty 5 a is low, 
right, then the melanoma has a low chance of metastasizing, right? So your control objective, right, if you're going to work with the Winti 5A network, your control objective would be to try to force Winti 5A to be low, right? So, so before, so how do you produce this network? Again, remember we covered all those ratio, um, what is it, uh, ratio of gene expression. Remember I discussed that paper. Then I also discussed the COD paper, right? So using the methods in the ratio paper and the methods that we discussed in the COD paper, right? Uh, you, you can actually come up with a network and uh, they came up with this network based on experiments that were carried out with 31 different cell lines, melanoma cell lines, right? And uh, they narrowed down the number of genes to 587. So based, based on the methods that I talked about in those pa papers that we discussed, you've already done homeworks on one of them, they were able to come up with a closely knit 10 gene network, right? Which I reduced to seven because see, dynamic programming is a very, very computationally intensive, right? Uh, like, uh, you know, things um, grow exponentially, right? In, in fact, dynamic programming suff suffers from what is called the curse of dimensionality. So that's why we cut down the number of genes from the 10 gene network, we further chopped it down to seven, right? And here they use ternary data because that comes up naturally from the ratio analysis. Okay, one, zero, minus one, right? So you have seven genes, you have to, each gene can take out one of three values, right? So you have a total of three to the power of seven possible states, right? That's still a large number, right? But if you have three to the power of 10, it'll make it much worse, right? So, so using the, the COD methods, all right? we came up with this network of, of interaction between these uh, seven genes, right? So, so e, and we used two gene predictors, like for this gene, MART1, there are two, two other genes, this one, and then this one that are predicting for it, right? We went through the COD exercise and found out which are the highest CODs, right? And then kept like uh, two of the two genes pr predictors, okay? So that's how we came up with the probabilistic Boolean network from which we got the Markov chain, right? and then applied the control method. And again, I mean, this was the first paper, so it's just, you know, proof of uh, principle, all right? So we actually, our objective here, actually initially in the first version of this paper, we had a toy example, all right? But then the reviews came back, they wanted us to use biological data. So that's when we ended up putting this Winti 5A example, all right? So the objective here, for reasons that I already outlined, is to downregulate the Winti 5A gene and we just arbitrarily said, okay, we are going to look at a, at a finite horizon problem that has five steps. Okay, so there's five step control action. And remember, terminal penalties, we said, we are going to assign in such a way that the bad states have high terminal penalties, right? Now, in this case, which are the bad states? Those are the, those are the states that have got Winti 5A high, right? Remember, because if Winti 5A is high, that means the melanoma has got a high chance of metastasizing, right? So we assigned six for when, uh, when uh, Winti 5A is upregulated. We assign zero for when Winti 5A is downregulated, that's a good state, and three when Winti 5A is unregulated, okay? That means it's, it's basically falling in the band around one, okay? So we did that, and then we went ahead and solved the, the problem uh, using dynamic programming. All right, don't worry about the first case, because the first case, I don't think it, it makes that much sense when you're trying to force Winti 5A gene itself to minus one, okay? Because you really, if you're going to force Winti 5A to minus one uh, to go low, you would like to use some other gene, right, in that network. And the biologist suggested pyrin as the control gene, right? So using as a pyrin as the control gene, we solved this problem, and uh, we made a few co conclusions, right? So first, using pyrin, Winti 5A cannot be downregulated to one for any, uh, to minus one for any initial state, because maybe you don't have enough steps in the control, right? So, you know, you have a whole bunch of states, right? I mean, three to the power of seven possible states, right? So you're not able to send it uh, to that value of minus one, the desired value for any initial state. And in the intermediate steps, the probability that Winti 5A would be minus one is not always higher with control than without it. However, for the final state, the, we were able to show that the probability of Winti 5A being minus one was always much higher with control than without it, which means the control is working. This stuff has to work, right? It may not work on the actual biological system because our modeling may not be perfect, perfect, right? But at least the math has to work out, right? And we were able to avoid bad absorbing states because there were some states that if you got in there, right, Winti 5A would remain permanently upregulated. So using control, we were able to avoid that kind of situation, right? So this, was the sum this is the summary of that first paper on the application of external control in, in Markov in gen genetic regulatory networks, right? So any questions?
and then we did, we you know developed several extensions that several natural extensions that I'm going to talk about right and see this stuff works really well on paper right and uh, but the problem is how do you know that the network that you're working on that that is the one that makes biological sense right so that's the problem right and and, and I'll get to how we are trying to address those issues all right so we did uh, so now this is like a math result so you know there are a lot of extensions that can be attempted based on, on stuff that is already available in the control literature, right? So we carried out a number of, uh, of extensions, all right? Some of them are significant and some of them are, uh, you know, uh, make biological sense, all right? Biologically motivated. The, f the most obvious extension is, is extending it to the uh, imperfect information case. Because remember, here I need the, the expression status of that, uh, of that gene, the entire gene activity profile. But let's say I cannot measure the expression, expression status of all the genes, right? So this is similar to observer design, and this is, again, the theory for that is already worked out, right, in, in, in the control literature. So, so in this case, the sufficient statistic is the conditional probability measure of the state given the information, right? This is what Professor Kumar covers in his class too, right, in stochastic systems class, right? So we apply it to this particular example, and this is the paper that we got, right? So IK is the information vector. Is, is the total information available at time t, uh, k. So if you don't have the state, then the best estimate of the state is the conditional probability of the state given the observation, right? This is well known, so we did that in this paper. So that was one extension. Another extension was to extend it to what are called context-sensitive probabilistic Boolean networks, right? See, like, the way we have set up the probabilistic Boolean network, we are saying that at each time point, right, the, you might be using a different predictor for each gene, right? But that may not really represent the true state of affairs, right? The, the actual biological system might evolve according to a fixed, pro, uh, fixed Boolean network for some time and then randomly switch to some other network, right? So we wanted to capture that. So the only difference is that in this case, you will have to, uh, you know, uh, be a little bit more subtle while trying to calculate the probability transition matrix, okay? So, So again, I mean, if you have a probabilistic Boolean network, all right, you have Boolean network number one, Boolean network number two, right? So if, if it is what is called an instantaneously random Boolean network, then you're assuming that every time point, there is, it is possible that we'll have a different network, right? But in context sensitive, you start, so you, you start out in one network, all right, Boolean network number one. So you make a transition. Let's say you are in state zero, 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 you go to zero, zero, one, right? If you stay in this network, then this is it. Right? But the other possibility is that the network might have flipped. Right? So you could have this possibility that you go from 0, 0, 0 up to 0, 0, 1, and if the network flips, you've ended up in 0, 0, 1 in a different network. Right? And the subsequent evolution will take place according to the transition diagram of this network. Right? So we looked at all the different possibilities. Right? So, so th there are a number of different possibilities that can occur, and this is the paper that has all the information co concerning this. The key point here is that if it's a con context-sensitive probabilistic Boolean network, that makes more biological sense, because at every time point, right, the network is not going to change, right? But the key po point to note is that once you've calculated the transition probability matrix, right, after taking into account this context-sensitive nature, the rest of the stuff will be exactly the same. Right? You'll use dynamic programming and do all that stuff, right, for a finite horizon problem. And so here we basically looked at the performance of the control, and I think the green one is with control. You can see that the expected cost is smaller with the control than without the control, right? All right, any questions? Between states, between states, okay. Between states, see, uh, you can look at it, uh, see, the transition between networks, okay, is going to induce, right, a, a, a transition probability between the different states. So you can go ahead and compute, right, that under this context-sensitive scenario, what is the probability, right, of going from each state to, you know, any other state. You can, you can go and compute that. That will, of course, depend on the, on the probability of, of selecting the network and so on. And that calculation, that entire calculation is done in this paper, right? So I had a PhD student at that time, you know. Uh, he, uh, he's right now an associate professor at uh, Texas Tech Lubbock. 
And believe it or not, I think he had like 10 journal papers by the time he finished, you know, so he, 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 so he worked on, on these problems and like for this one, for example, I just proposed the problem to him one day and in about a uh, couple of weeks he came up with the paper written, you know, so we just had to fix the English, send it out, you know, so. So even, even now also there are a lot of problems like that, okay, not here, right, but I'm going to show you where it's possible to, you know, make that kind of progress and, you know, graduate like a star, right, so. It's possible, but of course somebody has to be prepared to do the work. Yeah, he did that in this paper. Yeah. So it's possible that it can stay in one transition state, but the echo changes. Yeah, that that's one of the possibilities over there. Let's see. Uh, random perturbation. Okay. Yeah. See. Uh, it, it's possible. Maybe he didn't even exhaust all the possibilities. But see here. Like, we are not talking about transition. We are saying there's a random perturbation and a new network function is selected, okay? But somebody can say that there's no perturbation and a new network function is selected. It can happen. All right, the next problem that we looked at is controlling a family of networks. And why would you want to do that? Well, see, the, the thing is, if you remember, the, the you are working only with steady state data, okay? As I pointed out, the, the problem of developing a network model from steady state data is an ill-posed inverse problem, right? Because there are lots of different networks that will fit the steady state, right? So really, you will come up with a family of networks. Instead of saying that one network is going to fit, you're going to get a family of networks, right? So you'll have a collection of network, Boolean networks obtained from the steady state data, and the control algorithm can be derived to apply to the family of networks as opposed to a single network, right? And the weighting of each network is adaptively estimated from the available data. As you go along, as the network, as the, as the system evolves, all right, you adaptively estimate, you know, which network is dominant. And this work also was uh, published in 2006, right? So the details are there in this paper. And then finally, see, these problems, all the control problems that we have considered so far, we have looked at finite horizon problems, all right? Finite, that means over a finite time, but who decides for how long you're going to control the system, right? And not only that, how do you decide on what is the time scale? Is it one minute, is it one hour, is it five days, all right? How are you going to decide the biological time scale? So because of those re reasons, all right, it's probably better to look at the steady state behavior. Like if you can find a control which is a function of the state, right? And the function does not depend on time. If you end up in a particular state, you are going to apply this control action, right? That can be done by extending the horizon to infinity, right? So in, instead of working with a finite horizon problem, you extend the horizon to infinity, you get a, what is called a stationary policy, right? That, something that does not change with, with time, right? And that's what we worked out. So changing the steady state using stationary control, the control is independent of time, only depends on the state. So and in this case, the infinite horizon cost considered to to, to design the optimal control, right? And I'm going to show you the result of this, okay? The result of applying that uh, stationary policy, is, uh, uh, that stationary policy is that in the steady state, the probability mass will be higher in the desirable states, all right? Now again, go back to the Winty 5 way example. In the Winty 5 way example, we want to keep the expression of Winty 5 way gene low, all right? So all the states, all the states which have Winty 5 way high, they are bad states, okay? So we had a total of seven states, right? If you remember, I'm sorry, seven different genes, right? And each was ternary, right? I mean, it, it was either, uh, high, uh, it was upregulated, downregulated, or unregulated. Now combine all the downregulated and the unregulated together, right? So then you'll have a binary situation, right? So all the zeros and minus ones, you con combine them together, you treat them as class zero, and all the ones you treat as class one, right? Then we'll have a binary situation, not ternary anymore, okay? So if you have a binary situation, then you have seven genes, so you have a total of how many states? Two to the power of seven, that's 128 states, okay? Not only that, if you do the ordering, so you're listing the seven genes, all right? If you make sure that the most significant bit is the Winty 5A gene, right? That means all the numbers from 64 upwards, all right? They will correspond to Winty 5A equal to one. All right, so that means if I plot these numbers, all right, so 0 to 128, all the different states, from 64 onwards, all these guys are bad states. They correspond to 25A equal to 1, all right. So this is the steady state distribution of the PBN without the application of any control, right. You can see that the probability mass in the undesirable states, this is the probability mass, so the steady state probability mass is quite high. If we use control, you see that 
a lot of the probability mass has been shifted from here to this region, to the good states, all right? So, so that's what we showed in this particular paper, right? So, the, so it may not cure a particular cancer, but the chances of being in, that, in those undesirable states is lowered by the application of control, right? So, so around 2009 and all that, I was quite excited, you know, that, so we have done this, and, you know, now we can go and look at cancer cells or get the networks and do this stuff, right? And I wanted our biologist collaborator who has right now moved to College Station to just give me the data. You know, I will identify the networks and run it. And then he told me that, you know, you are applying sophisticated uh, uh, or, or you're, you're trying to apply sophisticated control systems, right? You're trying to build sophisticated sprinkler control systems. But let me tell you something, right? Biology has not f ha had its Newton as yet number one, right? And we have not figured out the basic plumbing, right? So, I mean, you can, all this on paper, it looks neat, all these different modifications. And there have been several students that have written papers on these, and that's okay, you know. Students have to graduate, you know. You cannot spend 20 years uh, trying to solve the real world problem, right? Because as, as a PhD student, you're supposed to learn how to do research, not necessarily solve, uh, you know, the most challenging, most formidable problems known to mankind, all right? So he gave me a different problem to look at, right? Because, again, I mean, and here the problems are, not, first of all, you don't even know whether the network is correct, okay? So whatever I'm seeing here, I might, might see something different, right? Right? The second thing is that here we are not using any prior information. We have tried to build these networks just looking at the data. But guess what? There's a lot of information that is available in the literature, right? Not perfect information, but in a marginal context, biologists know that if you upregulate this gene, right, something is going to happen. We need to find a way of incorporating that information into our design, okay? And so that is what is going to motivate the, uh, the rest of the presentation. But before that, any questions so far? And these are all the different steps, you know, like that we had used. For example, your microarray image, grid alignment, segmentation, gene expression, extraction, hypothesis testing. All these things I have covered in detail because this is, in this course, we have gone through all these chapters, okay? Then you look at... Uh, what is that? Uh, I talked about the seed algorithm and so on, right? At the end of the day, you'll come up with a probabilistic Boolean network, then you'll use dynamic programming, then finite horizon control, imperfect st state information, then you'll do the original steady state and the new steady state. And at least in theory, you are able to solve uh, this problem of uh, trying to uh, get the network to move from an undesirable state to a desirable one. Right. And so here, I mean, again, I mean, this is kind of a little bit old, but, you know, an issue is the controllability in gene regulatory network, right? Uh, so which gene, which among those genes are you going to use to try to affect some phenotype, right? That's a question, right? Then the other thing is that you'll have to look at robustness of the intervention strategies, because if the network that you're using, right, that does not happen to be the true network, right? And you don't know what the true network is. Is your design robust? So we have looked at that. There are some papers that have been published, right? You might want to do worst case design and so on, right? But uh, at the end, I like to say that you have to stay in touch with biology, right? And the biologists, because you're trying to solve that biological problem, medical problem, or some problem that is driven by agricultural applications, okay? You are not trying to solve a math problem here. All right, if, the math, if you want to do just math problem, just, you know, there are other areas within EE where you can just do that math problem, right? So if you stay focused on the biological problem, most probably the necessary math theory or something pretty close to it is probably available in the literature. Because these kind of problems come up even in, you know, internet traffic, congestion control, queuing theory, and so on, right? So shouldn't get carried away by elegant mathematics, and there is a critical need for experimental validation of network models, right? So now I'm going to f switch over to the other talk, okay? Which is, so this is the talk that I, I used to give several years ago, right? But since then, I mentioned to you that in 2009, he wanted us, the biologists wanted us to focus on, on problems that are closer to the real world, right? And so I will switch now to the other talk. Before that, any questions on this? I hope you're seeing the big picture come together, right? It's not like we have solved all the problems. There are a lot of open problems, right? But, uh, you know, the engineering portion and the biology, right? They, I, I hope they are coming together, right? If you didn't see the connections before. And they'll come... Uh, I mean, they'll come closer together when I when I finish the uh, the next presentation. Right. Any questions?
All right, so this is the seminar that I gave at the beginning of the semester. You know, some of you probably attended that, but now you'll see that things will make a lot more sense, all right? So the title was an engineering approach to cancer therapy design, right? So, and this, of course, we right now have the Center for Bioinformatics and Genomic Systems Engineering, where we are looking both at cancer as well as agricultural applications, right? Problems motivated by agricultural applications. So I'm finishing up the engineering part right now, but you will see that the same kind of problems come up in plant genomics also, where you're trying to increase the, the yield, right? You're trying to make a plant resistant to pathogen, right? Make it more drought resistant and so on, right? So again, in the beginning, it's all introduction to uh, molecular biology. That stuff, you guys know, you have taken tests. I hope you haven't forgotten everything from your first test, okay? So I don't need to spend any time. Then what is DNA, RNA, the base pairing, double helix, all right? Then you go from DNA to RNA to protein, right? Then we have the central dogma, molecular biology, try to explain functions of proteins, the role of DNA, RNA, right? Then what is the gene, right? Then uh, the question of genes turning on and off, right? Gene expression, right? That's you're going to show up on the on the exam on Thursday. So you guys already have read this stuff, you know. So and uh, so when a gene is being transcribed, it's said to be turned on or be expressed. And the base pairing between complementary DNA strands allows us to identify a particular strand if its complement is known. That's the basis of microarray technology, right? And we have discussed that in, the, in this class, right? How to analyze microarray images and so on. Then there's this introduction to cancer, right? Multicellular organisms, you know, and, and we have covered this in great detail in this class, right? So I don't even need to go, go through this. But again, if there are any questions, if somebody sees something that is unfamiliar, despite having taken this class, by all means, stop me, right? So we talk about uncontrolled cell division giving rise to a benign tumor. And then further mutations giving the tumor the ability to invade surrounding tissue, you get malignant tumor or a cancer. And then when it spreads, that's metastasis, right? Then there is this microarray diagram, right? This one you've seen repeatedly in, in that paper and I discussed it in the class, all right? This was that ratio analysis paper. Then after that, B, Boolean networks and PBNs, all right? Deterministic Boolean networks and genes. This is stuff you've seen before in, in the earlier slides that I showed you even today, right? This also you have seen, this one also you've seen, right? Alternative representation, you've seen that. Generalization to PBNs, right? You've seen that, right? Just today I covered all of these things, okay? These slides are common between the two presentations, right? Then this is context sensitive PBNs, and then how you get the stochastic uh, Markov chain representation. Now comes the new stuff, okay? I, as I said, you know, using control theory and all that kind of modeling, you can get results which are mathematically elegant, right? And you can relax assumptions and all that, you know, but the basic problem is not solved, right? The basic problem of actually showing that what you design, right, using the theory, right, that is going to make a difference in cancer or in plant genomics, right? That is not shown, that is hard, right? So my recommendation would be if you're a master's student, right, pick one of the, there are lots of open problems. When I, when I cover the biology and all the, uh, when I cover the plant biology, I'll mention some. Pick one of those problems. There is data about that problem that is available in the literature. Knowledge that is available. Go get that knowledge, right? Build your network, right? Using the methods that I'm going to talk about right now, right? Incorporating that prior information. Go ahead and, and propose your intervention strategy, right? Let's say to produce a new class of seeds or something. So if you're a master's student, I think what is reasonable for you is to pick up that stuff from the literature, right? And, and then, you know, propose your algorithm, do some simulations, see how it's working, right? But if you're a PhD student, I think you should be a little bit more ambitious, all right? You should not only propose that, right? Work with the, with the um, you know, biologists here, right? And I can link you up with them. So identify a biologist, work on that problem, right? Look at the literature, build up your model, right? And then come up with the change that you're proposing, right? And then try to close the loop, right? Because if you're a PhD student, you're going to be here for three, four years, right? Try to close the loop, okay, and, and see whether the thing works out. Even if it doesn't work out, you graduate. You know, you say whatever you did and why it didn't work out, you know. But I, but I think that would be a rough, uh, you know, research plan for a master's versus a PhD student, right? If you're a PhD student, I think it's a good idea if you can close the loop. And if you can really close the loop, you'll become famous, right? Because, you know, how many engineers are there that can, uh, you know, that will take the time to learn the biology and to 
uh, you know, make a contribution where it will really make a difference. Right. There are very few. There are hardly because you're fi finding out, you know, how much of new material you have to learn. Okay, it's much easier for you to learn some control theory and then do some try some extension of some problem and then graduate. Right. I don't know what you'll do after that, but or or even in communication theory, maybe relax something in the Viterbi algorithm and you know you think it's cool and all that. But here, th these are real problems. Sorry. So anyway. So there is prior biological knowledge that is available in the literature, right? And that is in the form of signaling pathways. This is marginal knowledge, right? And uh, let's assume that, the, again, as before, the gene or protein activity is quantized binarily, right? So, so before I get into this, I want to talk about growth factor signaling because this is going to come up even in the context of plant biology, right? So here, this is the membrane of a cell, all right? And this is a, a growth factor. When the growth factor comes and binds a transmembrane protein, right, on the boundary of the cell, there is signal transduction, there is signaling inside, right, there is kinase activity, all right, and then the cell can divide faster, right. So this is called the mitogen activated protein kinase pathway, all right, because mitosis is a kind of cell division, right. Mitogen is something that causes my mitosis, that basically ramps up mitosis, okay. So this is a mitogen activated because the mitogen will come and it will activate the protein kinases, right? Because something will get phosphorylated, it will in turn shape changes, it phosphorylates something else. It's a cascading effect, right? And that is important in, 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 in cellular growth, right? And even in response to uh, plant response to pathogens, the mitogen activated protein kinase pathway plays an important role, right? So they are similar. So what the biologist did was he told me instead of working on that to work on this diagram, right? And let me try to explain what is there in this diagram. So these guys are the growth factors. This is heparin binding, uh, epidermal growth factor, epidermal growth factor, and so on. So some of them are growth factors. So they will come and bind, right? See, on the membrane of the cell, the growth factor will come and bind. This is the growth factor receptor, and that is going to cause downstream sig signaling. So based on his understanding, all right, so these are guys are at the top are the growth factors, all right? And I think there's also a tumor suppressor over there. Then there are growth factor receptors on the membrane. So when the growth factor comes and binds these growth factor receptors, that causes this signaling. Right? That, so something will get phosphorylated, change its shape, it will interact with something else and so on. Right? So this is the diagram that he came up with. Now what is the net result? The net result is at the bottom. Right? If the growth factors are active, you have cell proliferation. And these genes, measure, these genes can be used to measure the extent of cell proliferation. They are indicators of cell proliferation. Right, so he has that, and then there are some other genes which are indicators of of uh, cell death. Okay, I think there was a total of seven genes here. Yeah, some of them have to do with apoptosis. Right, because remember, in and again, his focus was on cancer. You are trying to keep make sure that cells don't unnecessarily proliferate. Okay, they don't become cancerous, and two things can lead to that: excessive proliferation in the absence of growth factors, or if the breaks on cell division are released. Right, when they should not be. Right. Or if you, if you have too little cell death, because if you don't have enough cell death, that means the damaged cells are living on, right, and propagating the damaged descendants, right? So that's another place where you could get cancer, right? So your goal is to keep these, so these guys are indicators of cell death. Your goal is to make sure that cell death is running smoothly, apoptosis, and also you don't have unnecessary proliferation. So he gave us this diagram of the signaling diagram, and then superimposed on this diagram, he had these drugs. All right, this is a cancer anti-cancer drug. It's called lapartinib. So he knows the points of action of this drug. All right. Then there is another one, U zero one twenty six. All right. Again, these are kinase inhibitor drugs. All right. So they stop the activity of some kinase. So if you stick this one in, regardless of what is happening up upstream, the signal will not get down. Okay. So his the the problem that he posed to me was that you know given this diagram and this set of drugs, all right. Can you figure out a way to come up with the optimal combination of drugs, right? If I tell you what the response is, let's say, to some inputs from here, right? So that is much closer to the biological or medical challenge, right? Instead of writing all those equations and doing dynamic programming and so on, right, the question is, can you do that, right? And uh, the answer is yes, but again, keep in mind, the solution will, that we are going to get is going to be only as good as this model that he has given me. This is not complete information. Right, this is based on, on marginal knowledge that he has or from the literature. You know, if you, if you uh, survey the literature, you can come up with bits and pieces and then he's tried to put this thing together. Right. So I had a student right, at that time, a PhD student, who worked on, on, on this problem. 
And he was able to quickly see that he can model this using logic gates, right? Using Boolean logic gates, right? So he was able to model this. And then the key idea that he used was that here, if you're trying to treat cancer, okay, there has been some defective signaling somewhere, right? So question is looking at the input and output, can you figure out where that defective signaling took place? And accordingly, what the best drug combination will be, right? So, so that's essentially, that in a nutshell is what he did, right? So, so the input, right? See, in cancer, what is going to happen is that, see, you have four growth factors, one, two, three, four, and then there is a tumor suppressor. So the input that you will put in, okay, is all growth factor zero, right? And then the tumor suppressor is high. That means the break is on, all right? No accelerators. The cell shouldn't move. It should not multiply. So if you see something dif different from all zeros at the bottom, all right, over here, that means there's a problem. It's something like in your car, you have apl applied the brakes, you didn't apply the gas, the car is moving, all right? That means there's some problem somewhere, right? And you need to find that out without having to dissect this whole thing, right? So looking at this pattern and this pattern, can I make an educated guess about where the problem might be, right? And this is the kind of stuff that is used in the VLSI area. I and mean, some of you are interested in VLSI. They do testing in VLSI, right? That's where he got his idea from, right? So, so now, so on this diagram, what he did is he considered what are called stuck at faults, you know? So if a particular kinase is stuck at one, then it'll be signaling downstream regardless of whatever what is happening upstream, right? So you don't want that. So he basically went ahead and enumerated all the single faults that could lead to cell proliferation or reduced apoptosis, all right? Even with all zero, uh, four zeros and one here, okay? Because those are all the possible fault scenarios. So he went ahead and, uh, you know, figured out all those faults and I think stuck at one faults he labeled with one, stuck at zero faults, he, uh, I'm sorry, he colored in black. Yeah, stuck at, stuck at one false, he colored in black, and stuck at zero false, he, he colored in red, all right? And the false that we are interested in are the ones that will lead to a non-zero output here when the input here is all zeros and then just a one, okay? So he did that, and then uh, he was able to basically break up these faults into different classes because you know, different faults might induce the same signature over here, right? So he broke them up into different classes that are, uh, you know, colored differently here, right? Equivalent groups of faults. And then we also have to superimpose on the diagram the effect of the therapeutic drugs, right? So how do you do that? These are all kinase inhibitor drugs. So they will basically prevent the signal from going downstream. So he was able to model that as an inverted input to an AND gate. Because if the drug is there, if this is a bond, the output of that inverter will be zero. If this is an AND gate, the output will be zero regardless of what is coming from up there, right? So the activity of these different drugs he modeled in this fashion, and that led to the, to the following, oops, what happened? Okay. I don't know, I'm stuck on, Sorry. I'm kind of stuck on this picture, you know, so, but, uh, okay. All right, so, so the input is going to be all zeros and then a one, all right? And the output will be basically those seven, seven genes that you're looking at, right? And the drug vector, there are six, six drugs that are possible that he used, okay? Again, these are drugs that the biologist gave me, right? And uh, he'd given us also the points of action. So the drug vector, right? So how many, po so each drug we say it either can be applied or not applied, right? So binary, so there are two to the power of six possibilities for drug application, right? And he figured out that there were 24 possible faults that could lead to uncontrolled prolif proliferation, right? So he went ahead and uh, actually plotted he went ahead and plotted this, all right, carried out the simulation. So there are those six uh, different drugs, all right, over here. So you have the 64 possibilities, right, of drug application. Then along the, along the x-axis, you have all the different faults, numbered faults, all right. Zero corresponds to no fault, right, right at the top. And then one through 24, right. And then there is a color coding, right. 
that he did. So because basically, you see, you have those uh, seven different indicators at the bottom, right? So he was able to color code them where, where green means it's good. Right, if you apply the drug and you're getting green all throughout, that's good, right? Red is bad and then this is the gradation, right? Ba See, good means, okay, uh, when the input going in is all zeros and then one, right? You're having reduced proliferation, right? Bad means even when there is no, non-proliferative input, right? You're still getting a lot of cell proliferation, right? So this is the diagram that he came up with. And if you look here, uh, there is... Uh, like if you look at this particular combination here, where the fourth and the fifth one, uh, drug are one, all right, this is pretty good across all the faults, all right? It's pretty good, right? And you can see that even if you take three drugs, let's say fourth, fifth, and sixth, all right, it's almost the same. So you, you will, in chemotherapy, you're not going to unnecessarily add more drugs because you will cure the cancer, you'll kill the patient, right? That's, that's what will happen. You don't want that, right? Because these drugs have side effects. So he was able to come up with the, with that combination, right? And uh, so the the thing to do after this would have been to test this out, right? Like you pick that combination that you come up with a good combination, and pick some other combination that's not that good. S subject the cell lines, right, to these drugs, and then see whether it really performs significantly better, right? But here we were in a long distance relationship because the biologist was in Phoenix. So by the time we finished this, it's like two, two and a half, three years, right? So his interest had changed because this is about cell proliferation. See, the only reason this would not work, all right, is, is if that initial model that he gave us was not, not perfect. It, and it is not, right? So what, what do you want to do? In that case, what we want to do is start with that, treat that as your prior information, right, from the pathways. And then as new data becomes available, update the model, right? And, and hopefully get a better model based on which we can uh, you know, uh, provide some experimental validation. Now, what happened is uh, about two years ago, the biologist moved to college station. And so I thought I'll get this one done. But by then, he was not interested in this problem anymore. Why? Because this one targets cell proliferation, right? And he thinks that right now, he th because most of the cancer therapy approaches that have targeted cell proliferation, they have failed. Okay, why? Because it's a multivariate thing, right? You come up with this modulator, you think you will knock it out, right? And when you knock it out, Guess what? There are too many other redundancies. Something else kicks in. The, the, you know, whatever you knocked out is no longer necessary and the cancer can still uh, propagate, right? So what he wants to do right now is robustly target cell death, right? And I have a couple of students here that are working on that, right? So he has been able to come up with drugs which are showing remarkable success in inducing cell death, right? Regardless of the mutation, right? So what we are working on right, uh, right now, one of the things that we will be working on very shortly is, is there a systematic way? Because he has come, come up with that based on his expert knowledge, right? So is there a systematic way to do network modeling, right? And then predict, right, which are the drug combinations that will work, right? And, and hopefully we'll get his drug combination and even more, right, that'll work. And then, then we have a systematic way of, of uh, rational drug design. So that's one of the things that uh, that we are looking at right now, right? But uh, but that is about he's targeting cell death because once the cell dies, then the story is over, right? I mean, if you can robustly induce cell death, then the story is over, right? And the way you do that is there's this mitochondria in the cell, and I will talk about this in the context of plant biology. There's something called the electron transport system that powers the uh, that powers the cell, right? So if you can run the cell out of gas, it's like running a car out of gas, right? Then you don't have to worry about the runaway car anymore, right? So if you can do that and do it robustly, right? Then you're done, right? So, and he's had pretty good results with both with cell lines and with also mice, you know, so he's trying to scale those up right now. So the take home message here is that you need to combine prior knowledge, pathway knowledge, which is available, which is publicly available in the literature. There are, there are databases like KEG, which is Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes, and there are others, right, that have tons of data, right? So you can take that information, create your own pathways, right? And here, as I said, you know, we are focusing on targeting cell death versus cell proliferation. And the, these drugs, they target the outer mitochondrial membrane permeabilization because the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, right? So if these drugs, they go and mess up the mitochondria, the cell is dead, basically. Right? And uh, experimental validation of that is underway at CVGSE, right? 
And similar problems are motivated by agri-life applications, right? Because even in agricultural applications also, right? There are similar problems. And in fact, one of my students has already done work about, you know, pathogen uh, attack, right? On plants, right? With genes to intervene with. And that paper, I have already put it on the, uh, on the, on eCampus, right? I didn't mention it because I did it over the weekend, right? That's there, but you don't have to read that right now, okay? So, uh, you know, just focus on your exam and f starting next Tuesday, I will start talking about plant biology, right? And how, and again, the hard part is over, right? There's a lot of detail associated with, with uh, plant biology, right? Just one minute. Okay. Um, so, uh, the hard, hard part is is over because the hardest part was basically learning all that organic chemistry, right? Then you didn't even know what a gene was, DNA, RNA, protein, and so on, right? Then I showed you some of the engineering, and now I'll cover enough enough uh, plant biology, right, to show you that these engineering techniques can also be used over there, right? So again, try to give you the big picture, right? All right. So, a any questions? Any questions? So again, I mean, for master students who are looking for topics, all right, what you can do is, if you want to work on cancer, I have already covered whatever I, I was going to tell you, all right. You can go and look up, and for example, for prostate cancer, uh, one of my students has done a paper where, you know, try to come up with the optimal drug combination based on a survey of the literature, right? One of my PhD students has done that. I'm happy to share that with you. You can do it for some other cancer, right? That'll get you a master's degree, right? Right? And use, uh, I mean, use some of these engineering methods that'll get you. So it's not that difficult. Okay? The hard part is learning the biology and trying to work on something that is related to the biology, right? So any, any questions on that? Now, if somebody is going to work on agri-life applications, and for that, we have quite a bit of support here because the center is, is a joint center between T's and agri-life, right? So f for that, you might have to wait like for the next three, four weeks because I'll cover some material and tell you what the problems are. And then you, again, you can go to the literature and, and learn more about a specific problem, right? Build a network, design your intervention or, or you know, whatever combination you want of genes or whatever, right? And, and work with that, right? So starting next Tuesday, I will start lecturing about the, the plant biology, right? But the map kinase pathway that we talked about, that appears even in the, in the, in the plant biology uh, stuff also, because I had stuff over here about pathogen-triggered immunity and, uh, you know, this uh, MAP kinase pathway, actually, you can see, MAP KK, MAP K, that comes in there also. So it's, so it's a win-win situation. It's not like you have to learn everything from scratch, right, to work on plant genomics or right, problems that are driven by uh, agricultural applications. Yeah. So that's all for today. Any, any questions?